and Gina, I will turn it over to you. Great. So thank you, everyone, for taking an opportunity to um, start us out with that poll question. Well, we are um, the first of the content of an 11-part webinar series that is focused on thinking really deeply and intentionally about how we invest in infants and toddlers, particularly in using our quality set-aside dollars and our overall child care and development block grant funds to support infants and toddlers. I did want to start with this broader question. We're going to talk more about supply uh, with this webinar and then several other webinars and quality in our supply for infant toddler care. But some of those other topics that you see here on the screen, and I'm going to go ahead and move us to the results so you can see the summary of where people's answers fell, will help us as we think about the other sessions. So this, these are some thumbnails of some of the other content that will be covered on later webinar sessions because we are just at the beginning, as I said, of an 11-part webinar series that goes all the way into October. So you'll, you'll have probably seen, if you were able to register for this one, then you might have seen the flyer that had all the dates, which also had registration links for all of the other webinars. We will also make sure that that's available via the website where you can also access the recording for this particular session. So as you think about the other topics and dig into your state plans and your work more deeply, you have the opportunity to register for additional webinars. So well, we're in pretty good place right now. See that we're at almost 59% of folks are thinking about increasing the supply of infant toddler care, and we pretty much always link quality when we're talking about supply, particularly at this particular um, point in time. But we also know that access is a critical need as well, and we see there's a lot of response around access, and then also workforce issues. And probably supporting the quality of workforce and incentives for workforce and ret retention issues around workforce. So we appreciate seeing that that also shows up as pretty high related to where your energies are and where you need to focus your work. Close the poll. Back us up here just so that you have, so it's kind of like at the start of a flight. We want to make sure that we are all together on the same webinar. I am Gina Capito, and on behalf of the BUILD initiative, I want to welcome you to, as I mentioned, the first in the series of webinars supporting us to really thinking about what these great beginnings for infants and toddlers and how we use our child, federal child care and development block grant funds to support the first 1,000 days and really think intentionally about our investments in infants and toddlers. So that may be things that you're currently doing. It may be things that you're hoping to do, strategies that that you're thinking of that you're just not sure how that would work out or what it could look like. We're hoping to bring thought partners to the webinars, presentations of folks that have put some things into place, are working on other ideas, and engage in some lively discussion and really think about uh, ways that some of these things can be done. So support you if you're, you've got an idea, but you're kind of where do I push from here to, to keep it going. We're hoping to bring some of those concepts to the table and allow you some opportunity to meet with peers across the country through the webinar series. and spend some time thinking about these different ideas and strategies and approaches that are possible as we think about investing. So we are going to, I want to start out as introducing also our partners that BUILD is doing this webinar series which is also involves a series of blogs and does involve a landing page with resources as well linked to all of the different um, webinars and coming out content even in advance of some of the webinars. We'll be putting resources out there. We're doing this work with 0 to 3 and as well as CLASP. And today this webinar is hosted in partnership between myself and CLASP and Stephanie Schmidt from the CLASP. I want to get to us a slide so you can see Stephanie as well as myself. And we appreciate Stephanie's input and support in helping us build this content as we think more deeply about supply and some of the financial impacts and strategies and policy levers that can really help us to think more about supply. So before I go too much deeper into some of the context of and the opportunities for us right now with the increase in resources. I just want to do a quick overview of the webinar content so you have kind of an agenda for where we're headed this afternoon. So we are going to talk a little bit about the overall context of the federal funding, of course, but then we are going to go more into exploring some of the policy levers as I mentioned, and Stephanie from CLASP is going to lead us through some discussion of ways to increase supply for quality infant toddler care. And then we have great state presenters from both the state of Georgia as well as a program, large program within Minnesota that are going to share with us some of the things that they have in place in their state, which are opportunities for all of us to think about, and then also some things that they're hoping for or working towards and other strategies that they think may be useful as they consider how to make quality supply as accessible as possible and as consistent as possible for children and families. We do have 
a large group on the webinar, so we want to acknowledge that and acknowledge that we always are watching, and with Danielle's support as well as the other presenters, we're watching the chat box. So don't hesitate to use the chat box to communicate with us, pose questions in the chat box. We will then find ways to weave these in and present, pose these to the presenters as kind of appropriate within the content and try and make sure that we get your questions answered. Also, it's an opportunity that if there is a question or an idea that maybe isn't something we're covering on this particular webinar, it's an opportunity for us to plan for it for a future webinar or think about getting the resource out on the landing page as well. So there's a lot of different opportunities with this, with the webinar, the blog, and the landing page. So please don't hesitate to use the chat box as an opportunity to communicate with us. You also can, and as you heard Danielle say, as you were probably joining in on the audio, we do have all of the participants muted, again, because of the large size of participants in the webinar. Uh, you can raise your hand and we will watch uh, folks that might have their hand raised and then if possible, based on the, where we are in the webinar, unmute you and I'll give you the opportunity to ask your question too. But the chat is also a really good place just to hold any questions so if we can find a place to put it in for the presenters in the most appropriate place. But we want to try and be as interactive as possible within this type of context. So as we think more about the opportunities here, we've brought several speakers with us, and I just want to do an introduction to the speakers and context of the webinar that you see the content we're going to cover. So we're talking about funding strategies and policy changes that can make quality more available, can make more quality settings, take current settings, infantile programs, and raise their level of quality. That's really what we're focusing on. We've got actually two webinars that are focused on the concept of quality supply or supply and demand is the, the title of these two webinars. Of the two webinars, this one focuses more on the financing of quality supply and the second webinar, which is actually now going to be hosted on June 27th at 2 p.m. So if you registered for the original date, you're being moved to the June 27th date. And if it doesn't work for your calendar, then of course you cannot attend the webinar, but you have been moved if you've already registered. But wanted everybody to know that we're going to talk the second aspect of quality later in the month of June. And that one gets more at some of the programmatic strategies for supporting quality. And we know that there often is a lot of interplay between funding and financing, and programmatic strategies to increase quality. So we acknowledge that, that the questions and things that we're going to be covering are going to kind of go back and forth. But I just wanted to highlight that we do have two deep dive webinars on this idea of building quality supply. And this one is more focused on that financing aspect of building quality supply. And so to that point, we have several, as I mentioned, state speakers with us. We have Kristen Bernhard from the state of Georgia is going to be talking to us more about their experience with using contracting as a way to increase their supply of quality infant toddler care. And then we have both Sandy Simar and Ruth Lee coming at us from Families First of Minnesota, which is a large Head Start, Early Head Start, and Early Head Start Child Care Partnerships grantee and has been um, working within the state of Minnesota, where, which has state-based funding as well for Head Start and Early Head Start. So we're going to hear some about that and some of their work sharing some of their knowledge and expertise on ways to make building quality with community partners uh, more of an opportunity and less of a risky proposition when we think about the things that we need around stability of funding to increase quality. Stephanie, did you? I'm going to hop back to Stephanie's photo and just have Stephanie. I should have had Stephanie say hello on this slide so that you're all familiar with Stephanie's voice. Hi everyone, thanks for having me with you today. I'm excited um, for this webinar and glad to be a part of it. Thank you. So since this is the first of our content webinars focused on thinking more about how do we use our child care and development block grant federal funds to support quality, specifically thinking about infants and toddlers. I do want to give a little bit and get us all on the same page. And so this will be a very quick repeat of some of what you might have heard if you joined us on the launch webinar, which was this Monday afternoon where we did uh, overview of the whole series. And um, Christine from class did a little overview of the context of where we are with some additional funds that are coming into the Child Care and Development Block Grant. I want to do just a quick snapshot of that so that we are still all on the same page and kind of all working from the same playbook around what the opportunity is that's in front of us right now. And so we're just going to dig into it with a couple slides before we then we get into some of the, qual the content around building quality supply. So what we have right now, obviously we all know that we're all working on and states have had state plans related to the reauthorization of the Federal Child Care and Development Block Grant. 
and that, that reauthorization happened in 2014. We know uh, much more recently, in fact just this spring, the Child Care and Development Block Grant saw its largest one-year increase in the history of the implementation of the Block Grant, and that's the one of the you know, kind of key drivers of this webinar series is thinking about these additional resources that states are going to be receiving, how they can use it not just to support them in the overall implementation of things that are required of you as part of the reauthorization, but really think about how it can support you in your implementation of your quality set aside. And so we're just going to go through a couple of the details related to the actual uh, law and then this increase of funds. So that one year increase is what we see has occurred in FY18 is going to be approximately $2.4 billion. So that's where you see if we're going from the $6 billion there to the $8.1 billion, or just under $6 billion to the $8.1 billion to get us to that $2.4 billion increase in one year period. The distribution process or funding formula remains the same for the new dollars, and there's no new mandates on how the funding may be spent. So in part what this allows us to do is supporting, again, the quality and the other requirements and help, helps to make you more whole in implementing your child care and development block grant is one way to think about it you know, and everything that's required of you as part of it. So according to the budget deal that Congress passed, which was in the end of March, the funding that I noted here in this one-year increase for FY18, we should then see another $3.4 billion in FY19 to make the full amount that was passed in February to increase the child care development block right by a total of $5.8 billion. So as I mentioned, you've got several opportunities of things that you can do with the new funds. And again, because there's not new mandates that have come with the resources, it is looking back to the things that are kind of fundamentally that we know are part of the implementation of the grants in states. So some of it is, as I said, some of the reauthorization provisions and things that were already there that you're working on, how you're going to approach those as states. But then you have other opportunities related to quality and expanding access, raising rates for providers, thinking about how one of the requirements they have in front of you is this idea of building supply. So thinking more about what those strategies for building supply look like, and maybe there's areas where you were thinking that you needed a little more resources to really focus on building supply. This gives you potentially an opportunity to think about ways to do that at this point. Investing more in the workforce, and as we saw from that initial poll, that's an area where lots of folks are thinking around, is workforce supports and initiatives to support folks within your child care programs. And as a highlight from the original reauthorization, and this information remains the same, that the author reauthorization itself overall is moving the quality set aside to a total of 9%. And so for the current fiscal year, FY18, the quality set aside is at 8%. It will move up that last percentage point in the subsequent fiscal year. And then the infant toddler set aside needs to be at 3% and will remain at 3% in subsequent fiscal years for a total, though, overall of 12% in fiscal year 19 and 20. So fiscal year 18, we're at 8 and 3 percent, just to give you a sense of thinking about your quality activities. Do folks have any questions on some of those basics of the new funding that we are waiting on and then some of the requirements around the quality set aside, at least as a percentage? Don't hesitate to share any questions in the chat box. Okay, then let's talk building quality supply. So we know that this new resource as well as any of your existing resources for from the Federal Trial Current Development Block Grant, CCDBG, I'm going to start saying that and it's going to come out really fast, but I wanted to make sure we're all on the same page with the acronym, the acronym as I use it. But it also is thinking about your other funds. And some of the examples that, that states are going to bring to bear, and especially when we hear from the Minnesota folks, those are state resources that, that are currently used to increase access to quality care for young children. So that there's a lot of opportunities to think about ways that states have done things, how they're hoping to do things going forward, and what that can mean for you as you think about implementing some of these things as well. So what I wanted to stop before we get into thinking more about the policy levers and some very specific examples is just make sure that we have some shared understanding around this concept of supply and what do we mean by supply. And this is, a, if you've gone to presentations on any aspect of building supply within early care and education, whether it's specific to infants and toddlers or thinking about birth to five, the whole age group, uh, this is pretty common language that we hear again, that what we're thinking about quality supply is that we meet, we're really thinking about making sure that we have enough 
capacity to serve the infants and toddlers and that it's distributed in such a way that it's available to those families of infants and toddlers at the hours that they need and it's affordable for them and that it meets the standards of high quality care. So those are kind of three three big things that it's meets the that is available to the hours that are needed by families. So critical, right, that it's receptive to family need, that it's affordable, which is another aspect of family need, of course, and that it meets standards for high quality care and things that we have set as standards for high quality care. So that's when we really think about supply and we are analyzing what supply is available. We want to consider those factors as well. And I think that we all would agree that there are some unique features related to delivering quality care to infants and toddlers that make this a complex scenario when we really analyze where we are with quality supply. And some of those big ideas I think are some of the basics of that impact us as we're working on quality infant toddler supply, some things that it's important for us to all kind of have a shared common understanding around. And we know one of them is the financial viability of infant toddler care. We know it's very difficult to make infant toddler care financially viable. For Historically for years, programs have had larger operations with older children or lots of subsidizing of their infant toddler care and, and able to, in order to be able to stay in the black, you know, and not be constantly running their infant toddler program in the red. And we hear from programs across the country that they're able to run their infant toddler program because of having preschool programming and, be, and because of the balance of the two from a budgeting perspective. So one, one of the big things that we know when we think about developing infant toddler supply is holding on to that idea about the funds and what, how difficult it is to make infant toddler care financially viable. Another is that we know programs need a lot of programmatic supports to obtain and sustain or maintain their high quality implementation of infant toddler care. So things like professional development, support around family engagement, health, the child assessments, the implementation of relationship-based care and instruction for infants and toddlers and how oftentimes we really need to support professionals in really understanding how that's different than other aspects of um, child serving from three to five year olds or older children. It's very different for infants and toddlers. And to that point, what you see there on the screen are a couple of the principles that undergird this whole webinar series. And I felt like these were some of the ones that I shared them with you today because they are really um, some of the more critical concepts related to this idea of high quality care and why high quality care and thinking about our supply and always linking our supply to the quality of that supply is so critical for infants and toddlers. And it's critical due to some of the nature of infant and toddler development and how different it is in other periods of development, the rapid growth and changes that children from birth to three go through, and how they are so driven internally to learn. You cannot just apply strategies for teaching six and seven year olds to babies and just assume they're littler versions. And I think we all know that and I understand that in some ways I'm probably preaching to the choir, but I, I highlight it because I think it's critical to then thinking about the decisions we make around how do we increase quality supply. It's, an critical, it's a critical tie-in and one of the principles that this webinar series is built upon is really thinking about the development of infants and toddlers and how all of that development happens within a relationship. It happens within their family relationship, so two generations approaches that engage both the family as well as the child, and then also really understanding how critical the relationship is that the children have with their caregivers, that that's where their development and all of their learning happens within, within a child care setting. And so those are some critical concepts to think about for not just our whole webinar series, but it really does help us to underscore how that idea that programs need a lot of programmatic support to obtain and maintain their level of high quality, those are some of the reasons why, because of that uniqueness of infancy and how different the demands of child development are from birth to three. We know we need some really well-equipped, well-trained professionals that have the support to implement those types of relationship-based supports and really understand what's going on developmentally from birth to three. Then the other big thing that we know, kind of the basics of impacting the dynamics of supply for infants and toddlers, that is there times state and local policies will undercut supply for infant toddler care. So at times these things, it can be prohibitive from some of these policies, and that's why Stephanie's piece, thinking about policy levers, is so critical to our discussion because it can feel prohibitive at times when we have instances where, for instance, states increase grants to pre-K for facilities and operations without doing it in parallel process with increasing their grants for infants and toddlers. And so things that kind of de-incentivize 
offering infant toddler care if resources are being targeted only to preschool or pre-K programming at the same time. And we're also going to hear some from our folks in uh, presenters in Minnesota are going to share with us a little bit about this idea of how it is a risky proposition to partner with child care programs in order to raise their quality and to deliver that quality infant toddler care unless there are some more um, financially stable resources to support that work with community partners around delivering quality of care. And so that's another one of those things that we know that are going on that are kind of the context of which we are making these decisions and thinking about how do we increase the quality supply for infants and toddlers, the three big ideas. So what I would like to do next is one more poll, make sure that you're engaged and kind of with us is to think a little bit about this idea of supply and think about where you have the most information related to, and actually the least information related to your infant toddler supply. Where are the areas that, and this is to help us in thinking about what other resources do we need to be digging into when we think about supply and assessing supply and understanding supply. So from these choices, if folks would just take a couple minutes to reflect on, in regards to your areas of understanding of your infant toddler supply, where do you feel, what are the two areas that you feel you have the least information. So in watching the responses come in, and I believe that without closing the poll, I can actually skip to the results, and then you can see as the responses are coming in as well, you can kind of see some of the same things that we're seeing as presenters. It's kind of neck and neck between not having uh, information about where the gaps or surplus in supply exist within the state, which is uh, pretty fundamental, and then I was anticipating that the size of wait lists or type, the number of children that are on wait lists locally would be something that would maybe be part or particularly for state level folks to have a real kind of on the ground grasp of that local information. But you see that the, where the gaps and the surplus are is actually still out in front for everyone. And I, we did this poll as a part of just kind of making sure that we're thinking about, okay, so we're going to talk next about some strategies around addressing supply, but acknowledging that there are resources out there and there are some of which that we will share things from the Office of Children and Families as well as a template around a supply building action plan from one of the TA centers. There's some resources that we're going to put out on the landing pad that are designed at that addressing that very kind of fundamental issue of where are the gaps and surpluses in supply and how are you using data to map and answer questions around those to support you in if you're thinking about a strategy then is there an area of your state or communities that you're going to target the strategy, in, strategy initially based on data that tells you about the largest gaps in supply and where those exist in your state? Right, I'm going to go ahead, and there's still a couple responses coming in. I hate to close the poll on you all. I'll give you t 20 more seconds if folks haven't had a chance to respond. And while we're moving on to go into a little more depth now on some of the policy levers and strategies for addressing supply, I'd love it if folks would think a little bit about what is the um, one barrier or one area of information that would support you to be able to have more information on whichever of this list that, that you chose as impacting your infant toddler supply knowledge the most. Share in the chat any examples of why having more knowledge about where the gaps exist is a barrier right now, or why is that the area that you have the least information, just to help us unpack that issue a little more and understand uh, or what you would need in order to have more information on a, that particular area. And if after the poll is closed, if you didn't have an opportunity to weigh in on the poll, you're welcome to share your thoughts with us in the chat as well and tell us a little bit more about why it's an area that you have the least information or what it is that you need to support you to have more information. So I'm going to now turn it over to Stephanie Schmidt to 
start talking with us more about some of those policy levers and strategies related to infant toddler care and some of the context of overall uh, capacity of infant toddler care that we have right now. Great. Thanks, Gina. And good afternoon, everyone. Like I said, I'm very excited to be a part of the webinar today. Um, and I thought to begin, I would just sort of take a step back um, for a moment and look at um, a little bit about who we're talking about in terms of children and providers, particularly when we're talking about infants and toddlers in um, CCDBG. So broadly speaking, the number of children being served through CCDBG is at an all-time low, as I'm sure you all have been hearing um, and just know from your work um, at the state or locally. And uh, just to give you um, some specific numbers, in fiscal year 2016, which is the latest year that data are available, 1.37 million children were served um, across the country through CCDBG. 28% uh, of those children, or about 383,000, were infants and toddlers. So um, that's the bar you're seeing on the right, the 2016 um, number of children served. And when you compare this to 2006, and the reason we're comparing it to 2006 is that this is the year that the highest number of children were served, we see that we're serving significantly less children overall, meaning, of course, that we're serving significantly less infants and toddlers. And just to give you a little bit of perspective, when I say significantly, I mean more than 100,000 infants and toddlers less in 2016 than we were serving in 2006 in CCDBG. So that's an incredibly high number and um, really um, a, a large number of children who are no longer receiving subsidies um, and particularly a large number of infants and toddlers. So given that we're currently serving the fewest number of children in CCDBG's history, it's really critical that there's a lot of um, effort and emphasis um, put into how these new funds that Gina was highlighting earlier are used to increase the supply of childcare. And when you're thinking about expanding access for infants and toddlers, um, thinking about going beyond infant, the infant and toddler set-aside funds and looking for opportunities to make state policy implementation work better for families with young children is really important. So across the board, uh, states should really think about the needs of infants and toddlers in the context of who the children actually are in their state and figuring out what you know about their needs, their gaps in access, and how solutions for infants and toddlers might differ from solutions for children in other age groups in a given population. And I know Gina was just highlighting that with the poll that was there, and I'd be really interested in hearing more about what people are struggling to gather in terms of information to be able to really have that picture in mind to go into conversations about how the new funds can be used um, effectively and um, really um, to embed an infant toddler agenda into the broader state strategy. Um, so we can't really have a conversation just about the um, children when we're having a conversation about uh, supply, so we also need to talk about um, the number of providers in CCDBG. Um, so the number of children has decreased, obviously the number of providers has also decreased, and it really has decreased by a significant amount. What you see on the screen um, on the far left is that in 2006 there were 701,000 providers in CCDBG or receiving CCDBG funding. And currently, um, well in 2016, which is the most recent year of data, there were only 306,000 providers receiving um, CCDBG. So uh, more than half um, of the number of providers it has decreased by more than half um, in that 10-year period. And so clearly if we're having a conversation about supply, providers are a key component of the story and um, key to obviously increasing supply. And um, talking about supply also requires understanding where children are in care. So um, the chart that you're seeing on the screen is just about infants, um, not infants and toddlers, um, but looking at infants in CCDBG in both 2016 and in 2006. And what we see is a decrease in infants in family homes and an increase in infants in centers. And at first look, we think, um, might think this is fantastic. There's a decrease in um, the number of children in family homes, increase in the number of children in centers, a increase in the number of children in regulating settings. And it is good, uh, but it's not the whole story because if you take this chart in um, consideration with the decline in the number of infants in CCDBG, 
um, given that decline over the past few years, we know that in, and that we know that infants are more likely to be in unregulated care, there is a reason to believe that although the infants are no longer in family child care settings in CCDBG, that they're likely still in family child care settings. They're just no longer receiving the subsidy because um, the number of children being served has declined so significantly. So it looks better if you're just looking at this slide and this chart, but if you're putting it into the context of the broader picture and reality, um, it probably isn't actually this um, much better currently. So today I just wanted to touch base on a few key ideas for expanding supply. Um, this is certainly not a comprehensive list of all of the strategies out there. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to my friends in Georgia and Minnesota to talk more about what they're doing and the strategies that they're using and how they're actually implementing it. So this is sort of, sort of more a broad overview of a couple of the different strategies. Um, I'm going to talk more in detail about direct contracts, expanding access to early Head Start and payment rates in just a moment, but I also wanted to just mention um, two other strategies or considerations at the outset here. And the first is um, providing startup grants to center and home-based providers, which really sort of takes us back to the basics of creating supply. Um, getting started is obviously very expensive, and startup costs are often um, a significant barrier. And if you aren't able to get um, those startup costs or don't have those startup costs, it's really hard um, to start um, and help build the supply. So that's sort of one piece that I think is a really um, important component um, that I wanted to mention before going into um, some other pieces. And then the other is providing support for non-traditional hour care, which obviously is a very important one for infants and toddlers. And this can be done using a couple of the strategies that I'll highlight um, in a moment, particularly contracts. Um, and, and one uh, way for infants and toddlers specifically is using contracts with family child care providers who are able to provide that non-traditional hour care. Um, and it's, this one can be particularly effective when it's done through a network of family child care providers who can provide support for one another. Um, so just to be sure um, everyone is on the same page, I wanted to provide a little bit of information about what contracts are and how they're used. Um, as many of you probably know, child care assistance can be paid for through certificates, which are also called vouchers, um, or through contracts. Um, certificates are given to parents who subsequently find care with a provider who will accept it. If the child moves from one setting to another, the certificate travels with the child. And contracts, on the other hand, stay with the provider and eligible children fill the contracted slot. So if a child leaves, the contracted slot remains with the provider and is filled by another child. Direct contracts for high quality infant toddler care have been an effective strategy in states to increase the supply of high quality center and home-based care for infants. While CCDBG has always required states to offer parents a choice of care through direct contracts or grants or certificates, most CCDBG funded care is paid for through certificates. In 2016, just to give you a little bit of data, 89% of children received CCDBG-funded child care were served through certificates. Um, yet, if designed well and funded adequately, direct contracts for child care offer opportunities to build capacity or improve the quality of care for targeted populations, including infants and toddlers and children with disabilities. As part of the contract, states can require that child care providers meet high, higher quality standards beyond basic licensing requirements. Direct contracts also have the potential to offer more stable revenue to providers who are then able to make investments in better qualified teachers, supplies, materials, and other resources they may not have been able to afford. Contracts guarantee payment for a specific number of children, may guarantee payments over several years, and may be paid prospectively, which provides even more stability for a child care provider. However, the devil is really in the details when it comes to contracts because it's critical that contracts are sufficiently funded and um, appropriately set up for success because if states don't provide enough um, funding or um, support to meet the higher cost of a contract's requirements, it really undermines the purpose of the contract. Um, contracts can potentially address many needs and meet many goals. Um, for example, they can be used to create or stabilize care in particular communities or for specific populations. States have used contracts to promote high quality care for teen parents, homeless families, parents who work non-traditional hours, children in protective care, children of migrant farm workers, and of course infants and toddlers. 
Um, the reauthorization um, that Gina was highlighting requires states to prioritize services for children with special needs, children with families from very low income, with very low incomes, and children experiencing homelessness. Um, and states are also required to focus on improving access for families who, who face particular barriers to high quality care, such as families who need care during non-traditional hours or those in underserved communities. And the law is clear that it's not just about prioritizing enrollment. States may also consider paying higher rates, um, which we'll talk about in a minute, to support higher quality care for certain populations, waiving co-payments for poor families, using grants and contracts to reserve slots, or adjusting enrollment and eligibility procedures for priority populations. Contracts may also be used to create childcare slots meeting quality standards above minimum childcare licensing standards, such as better provider to child ratios and higher staff education or training requirements. States may require providers to meet national accreditation standards or higher levels of a state quality rating and improvement system. Contracts in Vermont um, have required programs to be nationally accredited, earn four or five stars on the state's QRS, and follow Head Start program performance standards if there are Head Start grantees, just as an example of a way one state does it. They can also be used to improve the quality of family child care by awarding contracts through support of family child care systems and increasing quality standards for participating family child care homes. Contracts can also be used to achieve some of the strategies that I'll mention on the next slide regarding expanding access to early Head Start. States can use increased resources directed to infants and toddlers to build on other investments in the youngest children. For example, Early Head Start Child Care Partnerships offer a new opportunity to better align child care and Early Head Start. As grantees work to implement and the partnership successfully, states can direct infant toddler resources in ways that support partnerships and increase the supply of child care providers who are able to meet high quality standards to participate in partnerships. And outside of the formal partnerships that exist, states can put support partnerships more informally between Early Head Start and center-based or and family child care providers to improve the quality of care by leveraging Early Head Start expertise and resources, delivering Early Head Start services in child care settings, or establishing policies that help to facilitate those partnerships. States can expand access to Early Head Start in other ways, too. States can extend the day or year of existing services by making additional funding available or implementing policies to ease the process of layering federal Early Head Start funding with other funding sources. This approach is often used to allow programs to extend their operating hours to meet the needs of working parents. Another strategy to expand access to Early Head Start is to expand the capacity of Early Head Start programs to increase the number of children and pregnant women. States can provide resources and assistance to child care providers to help them deliver services meeting Early Head Start standards by providing both funding and technical assistance directly to child care providers as well. And the final strategy that I'll highlight is payment rates. Most um, states differentiate payment rates based on certain factors such as the provider's location or the child's age or the quality of care that they're providing. Um, but I wanted to highlight that currently only four states set their payment rates for center-based care for infants at or above the federally recommended level of the 75th percentile of current market rates. Rate differentials um, specifically for infant and toddler providers are critical um, as current rates do not adequately cover the incremental costs for the provision of care that meets the needs of vulnerable young children. For example, the average cost of infant toddler care is almost double the average subsidy payment in CCDBG. So creating rate differentials for infant toddler providers and increasing rates more generally can help, um, are, are really two strategies that can help to build the supply of high quality um, infant care. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Kristen um, with the Georgia Department of Early Care and Learning to talk about their quality rated subsidy grant. Good afternoon, this is Kristen Bernhard. The Georgia Department of Early Care and Learning is a unique agency in that we're a, the state's standalone agency that consolidates all early child education functions. That includes, we are our state's CCDF uh, lead agency, we house our lottery funded pre-K program, 
We house child care licensing, Head Start collaboration, child and adult care food program, and all the other support services and funding streams that you can think of that kind of create that birth to five early childhood education system. We began the quality rate subsidy grants as a strategy to increase the quality of, supply of, and access to child care slots for young children, really focusing on birth to three. Then I'll tell you about how we're expanding the pipeline to think about full birth through pre-K uh, child care, high quality child care access. The goals of the quality rate subsidy grant were first, again, to improve access to high quality early care and education programs for low income families. Second, to reimburse providers at a rate that supports the cost of high quality care. Third, to create a predictable and stable subsidy funding model for child care providers. And finally, to create an opportunity for closer relationships between child care providers and families. It is important to note that when Georgia launched the quality rate subsidy grants, we already were a state early Head Start child care partnership grantee that was working both in family child care and center-based care with early Head Start partners. Uh, we had already launched bonuses to the child care workforce, specifically those that worked in infant and toddler care, and we already had a tiered reimbursement program that offered a 5, 10, and 25 percent tiered rate on top of our base child care subsidy rate. So the quality rate subsidy grants were just one of the strategies Georgia undertook to look at supply of infant and toddler care. So we began piloting different forms of quality rate subsidy grants in 2015, and we've tweaked the model several times since then. Three essential elements have remained the same throughout. First is that, as was mentioned, child care programs are awarded non-portable slots for a year. Second, family eligibility is determined at the child care program site by child care program staff in accordance with our state child care subsidy policy. And finally, the monthly rosters of children served determine those monthly payments. I think the second piece is really critical here for this conversation. As I already been mentioned, part of what needs to be considered when thinking about infant and toddler supply, particularly with CCDF set aside, is how are we making this care accessible and family friendly? On-site eligibility is a very family friendly process in Georgia. Parents simply show up to the child care program that they're interested in enrolling in, and the administrator who they will continue to see every day at drop off and pick up is the one who is helping process their eligibility paperwork. This can seem a lot less intimidating than submitting your paperwork online, only talking to someone through a 1-800 number, and never seeing face-to-face -face the person that's controlling your ability to have access to this service. In 2015, our subsidy grant model began with Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge funding. From 2015 to 2017, we were serving just about 500 children with a focus on children from birth through age three. This was scattered through 33 providers, all of whom had to be quality rated at the one, two, or three star level. And we're a three star rating system, so essentially just rated in our QRIS. However, beginning in January of this year, we pushed forward an expansion that is now CCDF funded, and we're now at 1,500 slots for children from birth through pre-K eligibility. Our next phase will expand in July, just two months away, and um, we'll scale up to 2,500 children from birth through pre-K eligibility. This represents about 5% of all children receiving subsidy in the state of Georgia. So what does the model look like now that we're using? Again, it's that annual grant for non-portable slots for children from age zero to four who are subsidy eligible. For us, it was important to add that three and early four year because our state-funded pre-K program in Georgia is quite large. We serve about 82,000 four-year-olds, about 60% of all four-year-olds in the state. Part of the goal for us was not only to improve the quality of infant toddler care, but think about that birth to five continuum and how can we ensure continuity of care so that children could age through these slots within one child care program all the way through our Georgia's pre-K program. Programs can scatter these slots through the eligible age group so that children truly can age through the program. And the nice thing about these grants is that children on subsidy grant slots, children with general certificate or vouchers, and children who pay tuition can all be in the same classroom. The children age out when they become pre-K eligible and then apply for a general CAP scholarship for before and after school care if needed. Programs that receive these slots cannot charge or assess any additional fees to the families who receive them. And we offer programs the opportunity for a hold harmless period of about two months where we pay them for slots, even when they're going unused, to allow for recruitment and also that little bit of startup money, as was mentioned. 
Programs who receive these grant-funded slots have to have a two- or three-star quality rating today, serve 50 or more children, have a pre-K classroom, and already serve some families who receive child care subsidy. We want to ensure the families we're trying to serve already have access to that program. We also look at targeted counties, and in Georgia, we determine a targeted county through a weighted formula that looks at child poverty, the percentage of low birth weight babies born in the county, the percentage of children experiencing homelessness, the percentage of dual language learners, the percentage of births in a county to mothers with less than a 12th grade education, and the percentage of children who are not meeting third grade level reading proficiency. This is run through a weighted formula that helps determine the areas that we're looking to target in the state. And then we have a competitive application um, for programs to apply to serve them. The slot is funded at roughly the 75th percentile of the market rate. And again, we're able to use our pre-K uh, billing system so that it's a similar system that programs are already used to to serve the infant toddler population. I think anytime you're trying something new, evaluation is critical and it can be helpful to learn from the evaluation of other states. And in May of 2017, with our Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge funded pilot, we commissioned an evaluation from Child Trends, which looked at qualitative evaluation, qualitative interviews of the child care program directors who were offering this grant opportunity. I've included the link there so you can go read the report in its entirety. It's under the research page on the DECAL website. But a couple of key findings that came out through these interviews, which I think speak again to the reason we're all here today, trying to think about how we can build the supply question. First is that parent engagement was a cornerstone of the Quality Rate Subsidy Grant Pilot Program. It makes a lot of sense. These families were not being assessed an additional fee. There was no tension about the billing process when they came to pick up their children. They were receiving a special benefit in a high quality program and had the opportunity for their children to age through this subsidy grant program. It's not too surprising that family engagement went up. The second, that overall those goals that I mentioned when we started the program is that overall they were achieved is that families who had previously struggled paying for childcare now, of course, did not. And about 60% of the children who were served by grant-funded slots were newly enrolled in these participating centers, which I think is important when we look at the decreasing number of CCDF-funded slots that are in the infant-toddler space. Third, we saw that the provider's main reason for applying for these grants was to help families. They saw the need to help families in their community whose children were not having access to early learning, and in some cases, help the families who were already in their center who couldn't afford co-pays or additional family fees. We did, however, see that there were multiple challenges with on-site eligibility determination. If anything, though, I think this contributed to the increased family engagement we saw, because when child care program directors saw the um, issues that families had producing the documentation, and the huge number of resources they had to be able to provide to help them prove their eligibility. It increased their understanding of what families were going through. Finally, providers reported using these grant resources to support the quality of their child care program. With a slot-funded grant, they could have used the funding towards anything that went above and beyond the basic operating costs. What we saw, though, was that more than 70% of providers purchased materials like developmental screening tools, books, playground equipment, used grant funds for teacher training, increased teacher pay, hired or retained teachers who had advanced credentials, and in some cases even added benefits such as health insurance uh, for their teaching staff across the program. So considerations, though, as you're thinking about where this might fit into your state strategy. As I mentioned, child care program administrative capacity can be a significant hurdle. We thought that having pre-K program experience would be enough to say that these programs had uh, the capability to administer this rather complex program. But as I mentioned, our Georgia's pre-K program, on-site eligibility is simply determining that a child is four years of age and lives in the state of Georgia. That's it. Determining eligibility for subsidy is significantly more complex. Second, we didn't want to leave any program who couldn't, uh, who was having difficulty with the on-site eligibility out in the cold and reduce uh, children's access to those slots and those programs. So ensuring that you have the resources to provide in-depth training to the providers administering this grant program is critical. At the same time, we had to make sure we have the monitoring staff in place who were able to go on site and provide that training, but also make sure that eligibility documentation was being provided. 
Also think about the financial sustainability of the rates you pick. When we were a small pilot program, uh, it was easy to set a very high reimbursement rate, but as we knew we wanted to scale and make this a sustainable part of Georgia's early learning infrastructure, we had to make sure that the rate we picked per slot was something that we could sustain as we went forward. Finally, I think it's important to think about additional quality standards. As I mentioned, all programs that receive quality rated subsidy grants today are two or three star rated, the highest levels in our QRIS. However, our grants now also require that the classrooms where grant funded slots are reduce ratios and group size, and also the teachers in those classrooms are provided with paid planning time. This makes the quality rate subsidy grant not just an initiative that helps increase access, supply, but also hopefully helps support the workforce with a better classroom environment. I'm happy to pause there for any questions, but I know we also have some great presentations from the folks in Minnesota. Thanks so much, Kristen. That was great. And I know that there is a lot of interest in understanding the mechanics of the contracting approach. So I'm going to give folks just a couple seconds in case there's any questions coming into the chat box, which I'm watching at the same time. And we can also, if you think of a question and it doesn't, it doesn't come to you right now, we can also do, we have a period of question and answer open at the end of the webinar too, because maybe it will come to folks closer toward the end of the webinar. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Sandy and Ruth and give a, just a little bit more detail on both of the individuals from Families First of Minnesota that are going to be talking to us more about some of the structural components in Minnesota and how they impact and how they implement and how it impacts them and their implementation of programming in their communities. As I mentioned, uh, they are both working in a large Head Start program in an organization called Families First of Minnesota. Uh, Sandy Simar is one of our speakers as the Head Start Director who is also the Head Start Collab Office Director for the State of Minnesota for several years, years and has had a lot of impact and experience with state structures such as state, the State Interagency Council for Children with Disabilities and the State Council on Early Care and Education and Child Care Systems. So Sandy brings perspective of working on things both locally and at the state level in Minnesota. And then Ruth is the Associate Director for the Head Start program and has nearly 20 years of work in Head Start across all of the different roles of implementing Head Start and has lots of experience and will be talking to us some about that idea of um, working to increase quality with partners and what that looks like on the ground working with partners in the community. So I believe, uh, Sandy, are you going to start us off? Yes, I will. Thanks. Good afternoon. And first of all, we're going to start with what are some of the current initiatives in Minnesota to expand the supply of quality infant toddler care. So um, one of the current initiatives is state-funded Early Head Start and Head Start. And Minnesota, several years ago, decided to appropriate general revenue funds to the federally designated Head Start programs in the state. And these, um, the, the, um, these funds were used to serve additional children. And at the local level, programs can determine, based on their community needs, whether they wanted to fund additional Early Head Start children or Head Start children. And now we have the option of also doing more Early Head Start Child Care Partnerships. The beauty of this model is that all of the state funding slots had to also comply with all the federal Head Start performance standards and regulations. So that's been a way for, um, to increase the capacity. And throughout our state, it's been really interesting looking, looking across the years how at the very beginning of this funding opportunity, most of the programs really focused on Head Start, serving three and four year olds. And now the greater majority of the programs are focusing on serving infants and toddlers, whether it be in home base, center base, or in partnership slots, really to respond to the changing needs in the communities. Another, um, another current way to uh, expand supply is through um, the state early learning scholarships. So families have an opportunity to apply for um, scholarships and through Pathway 1 scholarships, which go directly to the family. And the family brings that scholarship voucher to a program where they would like their children served. Right now in our state, though, most of that is for three and four-year-old children. Um, but there is the caveat that if the 
if there's an, a younger sibling, that sibling would be able to access a, a scholarship, or if it's a teen parent or a homeless, a family experiencing homelessness. Pathway 2 scholarships go directly to a high quality program. And this, these pathway scholarships are tied to our, Q, our quality rating system, uh, Parent Aware in Minnesota. So Pathway 2 go directly to the program. Currently in Minnesota, those Pathway 2 scholarships are used for um, three and four year old children, but we're really hoping that we'll have an opportunity to use that funding also for, for infants and toddlers. The federally funded Early Head Start also serves many families in uh, Minnesota. Uh, with, which follows all the Head Start performance standards, which does guarantee a high quality. And then locally, we also use some United Way funds to serve children. And I think the um, the part, the very the very first um, bullet that we had about CCAP is that we we would really um, advocate in Minnesota to allow that direct contract with programs because some of the, the um, experiences that we're, we are having with our partner sites, as Ruth can explain more, really um, lands around that consistency of care. And we're just really concerned that because of such a short infant toddler supply in Minnesota, that we're really hoping that parents, particularly of low-income children, who really need high-quality services and the benefits of those high-quality services are so important to their lives that families aren't having to choose um, you know, options that are, have much less quality than what they really need to be successful. I wanted to share a little bit about our, our model for our Early Head Start Child Care Partnership Program. Um, the program, um, where we are in third year, third year of implementation, um, and the program has a lot of structural and programmatic impacts on quality for the children and the centers. Um, not just those who are um, enrolled in our Early Head Start program, but also the children who, who attend the child care center who are, who are not enroll enrolled. Um, so we partner with two other Head Start grantees um, as, as well to provide this service. So we hold the grant, but two other, um, we partner with two other programs. And this really helps us um, expand the geographic area and support more um, locations that have high needs um, of access as well as quality. Um, so we offer enhancement fee over tuition to support programming. Um, and some of the enhancement fees that we offer over and above tuition go towards um, reduced ratio, so smaller ratio. So Head Start requires one teacher for every four children, infants, and toddlers, which differs from our state requirement, which is one to four for infants and one to seven for toddlers, and as well as a maximum group size of eight children. Um, <clears throat> as well as um, increased wages and facility enhancements. So uh, many of the classrooms in, early, in our Early Head Start classrooms also have children who attend who are not enrolled in the center. Um, at our eight locations, we have 82 Early Head Start children who are enrolled, but there are 196 children who attend those Early Head Start classrooms um, who are directly supported by the funding as well or receive the benefit from the funding. Um, there are many supports in Early Head Start that have a wide reach within the partnership sites for example, um, we invite all employees from all of our partners to attend all of our trainings. Um, during the first year, we provided several 12-hour authentic observation assessment trainings, and we ended up training uh, to over 200 people. For um, 30 of them were in our partner sites. So that was kind of a huge push. All the trainings are offered at no cost, and we were able to really promote those in working with our state quality improvement and rating system. Um, you know, they're the experts at finding locations for trainings, mm -hmm. um, and so we were able to work with them and train a large amount of, of, of teachers in this training. Um, all families in the center are invited to parenting education classes on many different topics, including dental care for infants and toddlers, attachment, and positive discipline. Following the Head Start model, the directors um, at the centers are really encouraging all their parents to get input on curriculum and assessment and center operation and decision making at these parent meetings. Um, 
And we have, we have really high attendance. For example, a center with eight early Head Start families enrolled might have a parent meeting with 35 families in attendance. Um, these monthly events are all organized um, with the centers and also our early Head Start staff kind of taking the leadership role with that. Um, we also partnered, another example is we partnered with our state um, parent aware QRS system to provide an 18 hour leadership training series based on the book by Anjal Pache, Evaluating and Supporting Early Childhood Teachers. Um, this is a leadership training meant for directors and we had 50 participants from across southern Minnesota um, come and spend three days um, learning how to best support their staff um, and it was, it was really amazing. We believe this, helped, this had a huge impact on quality um, and with, partner, with partnering with our state system, we were able to offer that for no cost to all of those directors. Um, one, of the many, one of the many exciting things that's occurring is the early Head Start teachers are also taking on leadership roles within their center. For example, at one site, the early Head Start teachers are on every staff meeting agenda to share some of the information they've learned through the trainings and coaching um, that, that we provide. Um, at this site, there are 20 infants and toddler classrooms. Two of them are early Head Start, but, um, but you're looking at um, a large amount of teachers who are receiving the benefit of the coaching and also the teachers who are, um, who are feeling um, in, like they're having a big impact on their center as well. Um, we offer monthly collaborative coaching um, each month where in each county the teachers get together and um, share, um, share their practices and work with a, work with a coach um, around a specific topic. One of the components is that the teachers video, one teacher each month videotapes themselves and shares that with the group, um, implementing a specific strategy with the child. Um, some of these things have really, we believe, decreased staff turnover. Um, We've seen a, a significant staff reduction in turnover since our first year of implementation to our third. Um, and you, you know, a lot of that is the increase in pay and, um, and also um, really feeling like a professional, having planning time, having, having, um, having the ability to coach and mentor their, their coworkers and, um, and feeling invested in this, in this field. Um, there also have been an increased ability to complete facility enhancements, such as replacing flooring, adding playground equipment, the, additional, the addition of open-ended toys for the classrooms. Um, directors shared that they had wanted to do these things but couldn't afford it. Um, one of the enhancements, once the enhancements were made in the infant and toddler classrooms, many centers were also able to independently support the same type of enhancements for their preschool classrooms, in essence giving the whole center an update. Um, or you know, mini makeover. Um, this year, um, we provided training on infant and toddler math materials and support um, to um, all the teach all the infant toddler teachers who are employed by our partnership sites. Um, teachers shared that they didn't realize how much they were already doing related to math. With their increased knowledge about what math looks like for this age group, they were better able to complete their observational assessment tool. We saw a noticeable increase in math outcomes for children. Um, one teacher commented she couldn't believe that she was doing geometry. <laughs> um, we also had success increasing the education level. Ten percent of um, our early childhood, our early partner, early Head Start partnership teachers this year obtained their child development associate credential. Many whose first language is not English. Um, at one site, because the EHS teachers were working on their CDAs, five more at the center decided to complete theirs as well. Um, you know, kind of creating that domino effect where people really get excited about learning and enhancing, enhancing their practice. Um, many centers were using preschool curriculum but did not have um, one that was age appropriate for younger children. All of the partnership sites now are using infant toddler curriculum in all their classrooms. Um, they're using lesson plans that support implementation to fidelity and include planning individually for, children, for child's development using ongoing assessment tools. So those are some examples of using the funding to, in, to enhance, uh, enhance the quality and really um, taking the funding that we do have and um, and stretching it to have a big impact on not just our partner sites, but the community as well. 
Thanks, Ruth. And that really highlights some of that impact information that you shared around your implementation of Early Head Start Child Care Partnerships underscores how, as we're thinking about building quality supply, that whether it's with the, what we hope will be you know, additional Early Head Start Child Care Partnerships resources from the Feds in the near future, but even if there isn't additional federal resources, that model of thinking about using a model like Early Head Start and then reaching out into child care communities and building their capacity has such a ripple and can have such an impact just thinking about in one year for 10% of the teachers, especially a number of them not being native English speakers to have received achieved their CDA is such a big impact in a one-year period. So it's really useful to think about our supply building strategies and have some concrete impact data to also think about as well so that we're not only hung up on when we actually end up getting child care subsidy or early Head Start child care partnership funds, but any we can implement that model. We could do a look-alike of that model similar to the way Minnesota also funds with state revenue early Head Start and Head Start slots. There was one question for you and Sandy around your United Way funding, if you could uh, talk a little bit more about that particular funding stream. Okay, we have a local United Way for our county, Olmsted County, and um, they have funding opportunities. And so we've got, we have actually gone together as a, um, a group of early childhood providers and asked for funding together to our local United Way. And they have funded us at a level, and then within that group, we determine where the unmet needs are. So this group is made up of Head Start, Early Head Start, Migrant Head Start, some school-based early childhood, and, some ch and um, also some child care centers. And as part of the condition of that funding, we have all used the gold assessment tool so that we're all reporting on our outcomes and the progress of our children as a group. Thank you. We are, if since could, we are, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I just wanted to make one more comment. Um, one of the things that's been the most difficult in the early Head Start Child Care Partnerships is that um, maintaining the child care assistance subsidy for our families. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's why we are so emphatic about really needing to have more stable funding in order to maintain that funding. Because within our early Head Start Child Care Partnership grants, we can set aside a small amount to cover that cost of subsidy replacement, but in some years, when there's a lot of um, turmoil within our families, it isn't enough to cover the cost of care. And we've, we've told our partners that we have to cover that cost of care according to our grant um, regulations. Right, and that speaks to that idea of that it can be a risky proposition to go out and seek childcare sites to increase the quality of their delivery when you don't have that stable source of funding to then support the delivery of the care to the children. Yes. Right. There, what I was going to let everyone know right now is that we are going to go ahead and so if you know you've got a lot of background noise, um, you're going to self-mute at this point. We are going to unmute all the lines so that if folks do have questions and they have not been able to put them in the chat box, they can. They have an opportunity in the last few minutes of the webinar to ask questions of Stephanie, Kristen, Sandy, or Ruth, and of any of the um, presenters that joined us. And I do see that there was a kind of a very specific question about understanding community assessment and a resource tool that might be useful for um, think with Head Start stakeholders and decision makers. And I was thinking that possibly that we could share that resource on the landing pad as well and then have a little bit of discussion, share it out with Ruth and Sandy to reflect on directly back to Lori. I think that that specific resource, because it would take a little time to look at the resource that the participant shared and I want to get back to you, Lori, with the question that you asked, but I acknowledge that it might be a little bit hard to do it um, since they want to probably look at the resource that you're sharing too and think a little bit about it. So we'll get, and then we'll also share related to this idea, it's about communi understanding community need for Head Start stakeholders. We'll share that resource on the landing pad for everyone else as well. The conference has been muted. The conference has been muted. The conference has been unmuted. All right, there we go. The conference, now we know we're unmuted. You can always tell. So if you can go ahead and mute yourself, which is star seven, I believe. Okay. Si usted quiere sacar su licencia, también necesitaría permiso de su de la persona que le alquila el lugar. Uh, y usted solo tendría que sacar la licencia. In the chat box, there is a link to the landing pad. And there also, there you can download the PowerPoint. 
Okay. So that is available for you too. And we're, we're going to put that link up again so it's at the end of the chat as well. So you'll be able to find it. You don't have to scroll back up and look for it. Okay. So I did have one question for Kristen in Georgia. I was curious about whether or not, and I wondered if this would help other folks, if there were any policy or other change that you needed to make at the state level in order to use the contracts approach. So we are very lucky in Georgia in that we are a very executive heavy state, which means that our agency is relegated the ability to set much of the policy and rulemaking um, for how we administer subsidy funds without going through a legislative process or even a board rulemaking approval process. Uh, I know most states are not that lucky. Um, the one big change we did have to make, though, is that in our state's CC CCDF plan, we did put an explicit goal around the transition of um, our subsidy model to more heavily focus on a contract-based or grant-based model. Thank you for that. So this is Chris, and again, it looks like there is a chat um, in the chat box asking about using a voucher versus contract approach in a way that addresses fiscal stability. And I'll just say that that was a primary reason for us looking at this grant-based model, because it assures providers that they'll receive that stable amount of monthly funding so long as they keep those slots full with eligible families. It also it helps us at the state level address um, financial stability um, because it's a set amount. It's very easy for us to budget for the year and know how many dollars we're putting out in slots and how many children we expect to be served. Um, so for us, that was a primary driver of looking at why we wanted to pursue a grant-based model was financial, financial and fiscal stability for providers. Any other questions for folks now that you're unmuted? So we have about less than 60 seconds on this first webinar, uh, and I just wanted to offer a one closing thought and then see if there was an, uh, any of the other presenters, speakers wanted to share a closing thought on reflecting on their work. I think that one of the big things that struck me in hearing about the on-site eligibility is how as we think about strategies, sometimes we get really thought, we, our thought process goes really much to thinking about, okay, I'm building supply or I'm, build, I'm increasing the quality of supply or I'm working on a workforce support, but how that on-site eligibility, which had a piece of your contracting approach also it's such a significant way to reduce another burden that families often face and help others to understand how much that is a burden for families and to help everybody kind of see what that really looks and feels like. And so I want to just to push folks as we think about, so it's so hard to tease out and put all this content across 10 different webinars when so much of it is interrelated. A strategy that is about building supply that had an implementation strategy like on-site eligibility actually does a ton to support families and to do better family engagement and have them feel more that they understand and are advocates for themselves and their children by having that kind of direct access and then instead of having to jump through all the, the hoops or kind of nameless, faceless hoops in many instances. So I push folks to think a little bit about that, how strategies can impact multiple areas of our system as we do the work. I'll start with uh, Stephanie. Do you have a closing thought for us? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, just to uh, add on to the question that Kristen was just addressing about using the um, contract as a way to provide um, financial stability, I think to Kristen's point about how they thoughtfully designed the contracts um, to ensure that they were creating um, stability both at the provider level and the state level, it's just so um, important not only for um, creating contracts and using that as a strategy to build supply, but also just thinking more broadly about the decisions that um, are being made as it relates to the way that the funding is used, um, the new funding is used. Um, at the state level um, to build supply and to address um, any of the other pieces of um, the goals, both short-term and long-term, that folks are trying to um, move forward as they um, are trying to improve the quality of child care and supply of child care assistance across their states. So just reiterating the need to um, sort of step back and assess what your goals 
are before moving forward and making sure you're um, looking at that data to see um, where there's unmet need and, and where um, the focus should be before moving forward with um, subsequent policy and implementation decisions to, to um, meet those needs is just really important. And I'll also just say that, um, you know, if we can be helpful in any ways um, in doing that, um, feel free to reach out to us. Um, I, I don't want to speak for BUILD, uh, Gina, I'll let you do that, but um, at class we're, we're glad to help if we can. Thanks, Stephanie. We are also want to put a couple of resources specific to that idea of kind of assessing need and really understanding supply. Put a couple of those on the landing page, and maybe there's some others that class can share as well out on the landing page to support folks on that understanding. So uh, bef before I see if Ruth or Sandy or Kristen has a closing thought for us on the webinar, I just want to thank all of the presenters, including Stephanie and including our state representatives and local program representatives for sharing their expertise and being willing to explore what works and what doesn't work and, and where you know that you want to do uh, more change. We know that we don't all have answers at this point, but we're kind of growing and learning together. But just quickly to see whether there are any other thoughts from Kristen or from a Minnesota with Ruth and Sandy. So this is Kristen. I'll just add that um, I think I, we all know that it's not going to be one strategy that fixes it all. Um, and so hopefully with all these webinars and all these great examples from other states, other providers, you can find the sort of menu of strategies that's going to move wherever you are in the system to the right place. Very good point. Thank you. Ruth or Sandy, any closing thoughts? Um, I think that our strategy has been really um, to target the, the child care centers that already have children who um, are receiving subsidy or qualify by income, and also to work with um, centers who traditionally don't serve low-income families um, and only serve upper-income families to really support access to um, so parents really have a choice because that's really what we want. We want parents to be able to um, select the child care center and the, the, care, the care avenue that is going to work best for them and they feel really comfortable leaving their child at because they know they're going to receive um, great care, loving care, educational care. Um, and so um, really thinking about where, what your community needs and what parents want um, and what, what, how, what, they, um, what they really need access too, as well as um, is, is a good, it's kind of been our approach and really where we, you know, we want to see the money heading. So. Great. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Thank you for hanging in there with us a few minutes past our intended end time. We know that there's so much content to cover on this topic of implementing the Federal Block Grant and really thinking about intentional focus on infants and toddlers. Um, as I said, we do have a part two of the supply and demand for building quality infant toddler supply, and that's on June 27th at 2 p.m. Eastern. And as I said, if you've already registered for the original date, you have been moved to that, but there will be a, a registration link for June 27th so that folks can make sure they get yourself registered to continue and think more about some of the programmatic strategies that we just began to discuss a little bit on today's webinar. Thank you all for your sh sharing via the chat box as well as the polls. It really helps us to think more about the types of resources and the way we frame these discussions going forward. So at this point, I just want to thank everyone again for their participation and all of our speakers and let you know that you can follow those links to the landing page to get the PowerPoint, the recording, and other resources will be there as well. Thank you so much.